Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I first want to thank the Knight Foundation, Alberto, Jennifer, Sam, and our fairy godmother, Robin, uh, for pulling us all together. It's quite an accomplishment. And I also just want to say how honored and privileged I am to be sharing a stage with these four people. It has been a pleasure over the last month to get to know them and to get to know their incredible stories, which they're going to share with you. So the economic tsunami that has hit the newspaper industry has been, as you all know, particularly destructive to local news with potentially very dire consequences. Corruption goes unchecked. Institutions that impact our everyday lives are not held to account. We lose our eyes on the street and our understanding of what's going on both across the street and across town. And we lose our shared knowledge that bridges divides and we become more divided. And this, this tsunami is accelerating at gale force speed with, as Ken Doctor put it, the financialization and consolidation of the industry by businesses whose primary interest is cutting costs to maximize cash flow, con consolidation for maximum efficiency, whatever that means, and to make money until there is no more money to make. Just consider what's happened in the past four months. The two largest news chains, Gannett, chains, Gannett and Gatehouse, merged, taking on $1.8 billion in debt and plans for slashing $300 million in operating costs. That's 261 newspapers and 30% of our local news coverage. Warren Buffett sold his 28 papers to Lee Enterprises for 70% less than he paid for them. The Tribune Company is now controlled by Alden Capital. I need not say any more about that. <laughs> and on February 13th, McClatchy declared Chapter 11 bankruptcy, having experienced the two-fisted punch of an 80% drop in ad revenues over the past decade and about $535 million in unfunded pension liabilities. That's 30 newspapers including Miami's beloved hometown paper, the Miami Herald, which is punching up against all odds, way beyond its weight class, with grit, determination, and commitment. And I just want everybody to give them a round of applause. OK, enough doom and gloom. Here's the good news. All across the country, local news is being revitalized in the public interest and as a public service with a incredibly wide range of models, for-profit, non-profit, newsroom collaboratives, startups, and transformation to new ownership models. But there is a common ingredient for success and sustainability, and it's called local, 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 and then I will say local. Local civic leadership, local attachment and roots, local community involvement, and local investment, be it commercial investment or philanthropic investment. Joining me in this conversation are representatives from two such institutions, both of whom have faced dire financial circumstances and quite frankly, existential crises, retooling and restructuring their news operations to chart a sustainable path forward. Our first speakers are David Hewlin, editor of the Anchorage Daily News, and Diane Kaplan, president of the Rasmussen Foundation, based in Anchorage, and I think they win the award for longest distance traveled. <laughs> Take it away. Thanks, Julie. Um, I have the privilege of being the editor of a local uh, an online and print newsroom with about 30 people um, in an amazing, complicated, interesting place. Um, we cover a medium-sized city and everything that goes with it, government, schools, crime, but we also cover Alaska, uh, this huge place with international economy, uh, complicated natural resource battles, climate change, 
recall campaign against the governor, um, in a couple hundred communities sprawling across this huge area that really face um, some, some real challenges. Um, we do that with a newsroom of about 30 people. Um, you know, all the challenges facing uh, local news that we've all been hearing about, they're real, uh, they're serious, um, and you know, we deal with them every day. And just to get something straight right from the beginning, we don't have, I don't have any magic uh, for how to, how to solve the local news uh, crisis, um, but we found some paths um, that for us at least uh, give us some hope for stability and, and sustainability uh, to be able to continue to serve our community uh, with local original reporting. Um, if you don't know us, um, we came very close to not existing. Uh, we were a long time McClatchy property. We were sold to, a, to an online only startup. Um, the thing ended up in chapter 11 in 2017. And then we were purchased, it could have gone a lot of different directions, but we were purchased by a local family um, with no publishing experience that had a strong interest in, in uh, maintaining local news, in, in uh, continuing local news in Alaska. Um, we had a big reorganization, painful downsizing, um, but we were profitable within a year. Um, we've, um, we've seen a big, we've embraced a big shift to direct reader revenue, um, and for us that really means an emphasis on digital subscriptions and, and digital audience. Um, and partnerships have become, as part of that, really important to us. Um, on the national level, there's a whole group of entities that are that are here at this conference that have been hugely helpful to us and 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 local news, you know, Knight Foundation, Pointer, uh, American Press Institute, Lenfest, um, all those are working to support news news organizations change their business models, uh, develop best practices, uh, and and really helping to nurture a community of news organizations out there. Um, that's, that's developed. We're working now with the Facebook Journalism Project on a digital subscription um, project uh, that includes our friends from Salt Lake City, actually. Um, Solutions Journalism Network, um, they were actually, they had a couple people up in Anchorage in our newsroom last week doing, um, doing training for our newsroom um, on, you know, maybe changing some ways that we report, not just focusing all the time on problems, but um, sometimes looking for fixes. Um, you know, that's kind of at the, at the national level, but for this thing to work, it has to be local, local, local. Uh, understanding the community, working with the community, serving the community, ultimately serving the community. Um, and so another way we've worked with partners is to find new ways to directly support local reporting and expand our capacity for it. And that's really central to, to everything, is strong, original local reporting. Um, we're now in our second year working with the ProPublica Local Reporting Network. Um, we're taking a deep, sustained look at sexual violence in Alaska and failures in, um, in law enforcement across Alaska. Um, ProPublica has underwritten the cost of a full-time reporter, um, which allowed us to hire reporters behind that person over the past two years, and also gave us support to just do that project in a way that gave it more power and impact than we could have done on our own. So that's been, you know, that's really been a, a great partnership. Um, we're excited to have a reporter starting this summer from Report for America. They're going to be focused on covering health care and, um, and public health in Alaska, which is one of the areas as the news um, ecosystem has kind of shrunk up there that's not being heavily covered, and we think there's some opportunity. Um, and we're experimenting with, um, with direct local support for, um, for reporting funded directly by a group of Alaska nonprofits. Um, several years ago, we developed a partnership with a group of nonprofits led by Rasmussen Foundation. Um, we spent a year um, 
reporting on the impacts of alcoholism in Alaska. Um, this group of nonprofits uh, paid for a reporter and a photographer full time. Um, we retained sole control over the content, had a contract that reflected that, it felt like we were, that was pretty early in, in that whole process of, of developing these partnerships. Uh, so we're in the early stages of developing a new partnership um, uh, similar to that, that's gonna, we hope, take a sustained look at homelessness in, um, in Alaska. Um, that's just one more path to uh, independent, original, local reporting. And we're looking for ways to do more. So what gets said here in Miami stays here in Miami. So everyone be truthful and transparent. So raise your hand if you had your first drink of alcohol, not including communion wine or Passover wine, when you were 12 or under, 13, 14, 15, 16, under 18, not until you were over 21. Oh, no one raised their hand. Okay. <laughs> so I came to Alaska for two years, and that was 35 years ago, like a lot of other people. And since I've been there, I have never met a single person who hasn't experienced misery because of someone drinking too much, even in my own family. More than 10 years ago, a board member of Rasmussen Foundation, who is a superior court judge, she's now on the Ninth Circuit, was coming to the end of her term. And she said, if we don't do something about alcohol before I leave this board, I'm not gonna be able to live with myself. Every day, a parade of people came in front of her. They were requesting domestic violence restraining orders, divorces. It was children in need of aid, but it was really all alcohol. Four of the five leading causes of death for Native men in Alaska are alcohol related. So we convened 20 Alaska leaders and we decided to create a new way of thinking and called it Recover Alaska. So those of you who raised your hand at 12, 13, or 14, listen up because we learned very early on the most significant factor in determining if a person will have problems with alcohol later in life is the age of their first drink. Most teenagers think most teenagers drink. In fact, most teenagers do not drink. But if most teenagers thought most teenagers didn't drink, they'd be less likely to drink. And we knew right there we needed a media strategy if we were gonna be successful. The first time I approached the Daily News, and it was David's predecessor, and suggested we have a partnership, I think he said something like, I'd rather have my teeth worked on with a rusty drill than take a penny from the Rasmussen Foundation. But by 2013, things had changed, and the time was right. So as David said, we funded one reporter, one photographer, and the state of intoxication was started. It won national and regional recognition and included photography and videography. Here is the Recover Alaska website. And in the second slide that you'll see is Darlene Trigg. She's an Alaska native in Nome, Alaska, who formed a patrol of safety officers. And it was really important to show an Alaska native in a problem-solving role, not as a victim, not as an abuser, because most people in Alaska think most people who have a problem with alcohol are natives. And in this slide, you can see Art Ivanov, who just found out that his friend froze to death outside as a result of drinking too much. We never expected video to be part of the project. It wasn't even in the contract. But it ended up being one of the most powerful parts of the program. Heidi Case moved from Utah to Alaska to access better treatment for her son, who had fetal alcohol syndrome. You know, the doctors always tell you don't drink when you're pregnant, but what they don't tell you is why. Oh. Is Dad home? Yeah, he's upstairs. <laughs> Sorry. I'm trying to think how I would describe Jacob. He's a sweet kid when he wants to be, and then he has that other side of him. You know, it's an everyday constant 
battle with him trying to get him to do anything, really. I actually knew something was wrong with Jacob before he was even born. If you drink at all and you're sexually active, you're a candidate. Your child's a candidate. That's all there is to it. I've had a lot of time, you know, to, to process. And the hardest thing is just knowing um, that it won't ever go away. Two critical elements to getting to yes from no. First of all, we presented the Anchorage Daily News with a copy of the contract between the Ford Foundations and the Washington Post and uh, with the LA Times. And I think that presented that this was gonna become a model that every newspaper had to look at. And secondly, we brought in five or six other funders so it wasn't just Rasmussen Foundation and the Anchorage Daily News. And we did it through a fund at the Alaska Community Foundation so there was some distance between the funders and the newspaper. The very first story that ran really pissed off one of the funders. <laughs> and I tell funders, if you're going to get in this, it's not a question of if there will be a story you're not going to like, it's when there will be a story you're not going to like. And if you're not comfortable with that, this isn't the thing for you. That's right. Thank you. Thank you, David, and, and thank you, Diane. True words have never been spoken. Um, our next speakers are Paul Huntsman and Fraser Nelson. Uh, Paul is the president and CEO of the Huntsman Family Investments and the publisher and soon to be not owner, uh, but owner of the Salt Lake Tribune and for business innovation for the Salt Lake Tribune. Take it away, and I should say, the folks who have created the unprecedented first step, the, the first for-profit news organization in America that has successfully convinced the IRS to convert it to nonprofit status. Congratulations. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Julie. So, as Julie mentioned, I am the, uh, I'm the publisher and owner of the Salt Lake Tribune. Uh, I hope next week to be the chairman of the board as we, uh, as we legally make the transition to a, uh, to a, a nonprofit. We put our application in uh, this last winter. I expected a ruling with a lot of questions uh, in February is what I was told. And we received uh, um, a letter from the IRS last November accepting our application as is. So we are, uh, we've spent the last three months uh, working through the transition and we're just right on the cusp now of legally now uh, moving all of the assets into a, uh, into a nonprofit entity. But I'm so grateful to be able to uh, share a little bit about our story with you today. Uh, I come from a family of, uh, of entrepreneurs, of civic-minded individuals as well as philanthropist. And uh, as Julie mentioned, my day job, which I thought I'd be spending the vast majority of my time, is in investments, uh, not too dissimilar to what you would find in private equity. And when uh, the opportunity uh, came up to acquire the Salt Lake Tribune, which uh, four years ago was in financial turmoil uh, due to some uh, short-term decisions at the uh, that the uh, hedge fund owner uh, had done to the, to the paper, I realized that as I looked at our community going forward that uh, you know, our community simply would not be able to function as it has been. And as we look at all the challenges and opportunities going forward, to not have the paper of record for the last 150 years in the state of Utah 
And so um, as we've gone down this journey, I've, uh, I, I do not have a background in journalism. I never expected uh, to be a publisher five years ago. Uh, I went around the country and I visited with a lot of the uh, leaders, many of you here in the room, um, Alberto being one, the Lenfest Institute, um, and so many others. And I realized that, um, that the pathway that we needed to go down to, and again, it was all about long-term sustainability. The, uh, the business model for local newspapers is, uh, is completely broken as the industry has been shifting from a print product to a digital product. And uh, I think every newspaper and community needs to figure out what that right pathway is. And for us, uh, like a lot of problems that was mentioned and challenges that was mentioned earlier this morning, um, you know, uh, uh, problems are solved on the local level. We had to bring the stewardship back to the local community and have some leadership and to be able to solve this moving forward. This is something that we would not be able to do without the strong support of, uh, of our, not only of our community leaders, but our citizens at large. And so we're very early on in this experiment and, uh, and so far the community has been very, very supportive. We're very encouraged by what we're hearing and uh, really, really grateful for the position that we're in right now and, and, and very confident that we're gonna be able to sustain this longer term. Okay. Um, well, I wanna again thank everyone for being here. I also wanna just give a shout out to my sisters in arms who've really been with us from the very beginning, Jennifer Preston at night, Terry Quinn from the Texas Tribune and Annie Madonia from uh, Lenfest, you know, these women, and there's so many in the room, have taken steps forward. We may be the first print and legacy Metropolitan Daily to become a nonprofit, but there are many models out there that we're able to, to not put too fine a point on, you know, steal from uh, very generously. So I'm like Paul, I don't come from the, the jur a journalistic background. I've spent my life in nonprofits and public service and some work with foundations. And in some ways, I kind of see myself as the test case for a person that would pay more for the news that is so important to all the work that I've done in my life. And when Paul approached me and said, I have this idea to turn the paper into a nonprofit, it really just felt like a natural. And I had absolute confidence that the IRS would support our idea because newspapers are, as Alberto said, just clearly for the public good. The only difference with our model is that now that public good is shared between our institution and the community that we serve. The leadership of the paper, the, the way we interact with the community, our accountability to them has deepened by our becoming a not-for-profit. And our vision, and it's one I hope that we'll be able to share our success with you over the long term, is to really help create a new and sustainable model for institutions like ours that are the paper of record in their communities, that are vital to the civil and civic, and I want to emphasize civil and civic discourse that we need in our, in our state to become the state we want to be and the democracy we believe we are in the United States. Our model is really adaptable. We, when we approached the IRS, we said, everything we're doing now, we want to continue to be able to do sell advertising for as much and as long as we can, sell subscriptions, which aren't necessarily deductible because they are a good and a service, but continue to receive the revenue from the community that values what we provide, um, to allow philanthropists, national, for those of you in the room, national philanthropists, as well as local philanthropists, to support this model and to support the tool that journalism brings to our democracy. We're also doing more community engagement work and we'll look for ways to, to deepen our, our discourse with the community. The only thing we don't do now is endorse candidates, which from my point of view is really helpful because Paul's brother is running for governor. <laughs> so if things weren't complicated enough, being, being able to give that up. But we certainly will continue to have a very strong opinion page. One of the nice things too that a nonprofit model allows us 
is to provide um, and amplify the diversity of voices that can be on that opinion page. So we're reaching deeper into the community to find um, a place for, again, that civil, civic di dialogue. We're also creating a longer-term solution called the Utah Journalism Foundation. This is an endowment. Our immediate goal is to raise about $60 million, 20 by the end of next year. And the earnings from that endowment will go to support not only the Salt Lake Tribune, but also emerging voices in our community. We're concerned about the rural communities in our state that are losing their local journalism. We're concerned about emerging voices like our really large and vibrant refugee community in Utah, our tribal nations, um, our large Latinx community. We want to make sure that as people lose um, their local journalism, we're there to help support it. And uh, I think that becoming a nonprofit opens up all kinds of really exciting, exciting opportunities for collaboration, for deepening our engagement with our members, for community ownership, community accountability, and incredible community journalism. We look forward to sharing our progress with each of you, and thank you for all the cheering that you've been doing for us. It means a tremendous amount to us. So the way this is going to go is I'm going to ask a few questions and then we're going to open it up in about 15 minutes. But I, I want to start with, with you, Diane. Um, you and Rasmussen have been real pioneers in um, forging the notion of philanthropic support for journalism as core part of your mission. How did you convince your other philanthropic partners to do it? How did you build the base of support in your local community? so that this is business as usual and not just a one-off? It's become very complicated. In the old days, you could put an ad in the Anchorage Daily News and on the Channel 2 News, and you'd reach the entire state, pretty much. There is no way to really get information out very efficiently anymore. So it really requires, if you're involved in issues like we are, and homelessness is a very, um, complicated issue and it's not easily understood and it's easily um, misunderstood. So um, this time around, it actually was easy. Um, I think we're gonna have seven or eight other partners who are gonna fund it and it's been very easy to get them to do so. First of all, we all wanna have impact with our philanthropic dollars. And there's something about a newspaper that it's not social media, it's not radio, it's not TV. You can place a newspaper on the seat of a state legislator so that when they get in their chair, it's sitting there and the front page is about alcohol. And it had a very direct impact, the reporting, on policy. So if you're, a, if you're serious in philanthropy and you're trying to change public norms, change public policy, um, you can't do it without a media strategy, and I think we have all figured out it's got to be part of the plan. Amen. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And David, just as a follow-up, last night, Minnie Marcus said something that really struck me, which was that given the constraint resources she was dealing with, she had to create some priorities in what her reporters were focusing on, and those priorities were accountability and investigative journalism. And um, this is a tension in the newsroom because part of your job is covering the school board hearings and covering the zoning hearings and reporting on who's running for what office. And just if you could give a few minutes on how you balance those tensions or how you deal with those tensions in a constrained resource environment. Um, as everything has shrunk, it's just gotten harder. Um, and there needs to be more horsepower for local reporting, you know, all the way around. Uh, investigative reporting, accountability reporting, it's hard. It's time intensive. It's expensive. Um, but we've also, we found, I think, like pretty much every, every newsroom has found, public, uh, the community really values that kind of reporting. Um, so we've, we are trying everything we can to, uh, to get support for that kind of reporting, but that's not the only um, job we have. It's not the only thing that our community expects from us. 
and, and that's, you know, and that really is the rub. I mean, it's, it's covering institutions that are important day to day. Uh, and for us, it's, you know, it's just covering important breaking news is important for us on, online. That's a big part of our, of our, uh, of our audience. Uh, and, and so it, it's just trying to make smart choices every, every day and hopefully building more resources as we go along. And Paul and Fraser. So uh, getting the IRS to give you, I guess, a preliminary approval because it's a five-year test process um, means that you've got to prove two things, that you have a governance that's an independent board of directors representative of the community you serve, and it means that you have to build a broad and diverse base of support. Um, how are you planning on doing both of those? Well, if I can just highlight the second part of the question of building out, uh, <laughs> building out a board, we're going to be holding our first board meeting this Friday, which I'm, uh, which I'm really excited about. And as you talk about a diverse board for a newspaper, uh, just take a look at who our core reader base is. It's, it's white, it's highly educated, it's center left, and you can almost uh, draw a fairly narrow circle in terms of uh, the geographic region uh, in Salt Lake City of where most of our readers are from. So as you look at a, a broader, diverse audience, uh, to me, uh, my priority in building out a board was to go young, and when I mean young, I mean very young, as in the 20s, more of a technological uh, 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 oriented um, group of individuals, uh, as well as begin to reach out to, uh, to our diverse populations uh, who, uh, who I believe that the paper in the past few decades has not, uh, has not good, done a very good job in reaching out to. And then we also have to, uh, have to maintain a presence of our existing readers, which is, which is the group that I just described. So as I'm collecting this group, uh, we've got individuals uh, that are in their late 70s and we have individuals in their mid-20s. Uh, with a wide variety of um, ideological backgrounds, of uh, uh, coming at it with uh, with a variety of different uh, understandings of technological to tools, but all with a passion of journalism and wanting to solve this and wanting to broaden the reach of our audience uh, in terms of how is journalism going to look, and what is our focus going to be as we, uh, as we enter in, into uh, 2021? So I'm really looking forward to, uh, to this very, very diverse group of, uh, group of individuals and the challenges that I have given them to, uh, to really look at broadening the appeal of our journalism to reach a much broader and a much younger audience that needs to be much more engaged in journalism. Great. And part two. Yeah, in terms of um, diversifying the, the funding source and to make sure that we don't have just one or two major funders, I mean, that's the, the big public asset test, we uh, launched a DRIP campaign, a DRIP fundraising campaign, right after we became a not-for-profit to explain to our readers, newsletter readers as well as, as paying subscribers, what we were up to and what we asked them to do. And I'm really pleased that to date we've had almost 2,000 um, people come forward with a donation, not even wow. tied to access to the paper, but just That's saying go impressive. team. And those, those wow. grants have, those gifts have ranged from a dollar to $10,000. And this was just in a very light touch. We're also establishing a major gift program, and of course we're um, getting the support of our, of our key local foundations. Um, I think that the diversity of the size of gifts says something. I think we also have surveyed our readers and asked them what, and, and people who weren't readers, and asked them what life would be like without the Tribune, and would they be willing to support it, either by subscribing or by making a donation. And, you know, granted it was a, a group of people that we thought were enthusiastic, but we heard um, that 80% said they really couldn't imagine life in Utah without the Tribune. That is, you know, astonishing to me. And what we, we need to do is convert, convert them now to supporters in a, in a bigger sense. But that's very, 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 um, I think, hopeful for our future. It's very promising. Um, I think I probably have 
room for one or two last questions. I'm going to go back to David um, and, and Diane. You have both been extraordinarily entrepreneurial in seeking out every possible local and national resource to, to build up and beef up your reporting at, at the Daily News. What has that meant for the newsroom? That's, that must have created some sort of tensions or changes in how you actually do your job every day. Uh, no, there's just been so much evolution over the past, past few years that I think that has become um, you know, just part of it, although kind of at every step, I think what we've, what we've at least tried to do is, is find a way to do these things that maintain our core values. Um, you know, it has to do with, it's local, it has to do with maintaining those journalistic values. Um, it, it, as the thing as the things evolved, and I, you know, um, you know, I, I think that's that's what. I'd say. Great. Should we open it up? Yes. Questions. We have mic runners. Question up here. Thank you, and it's so nice to have a happy panel. Uh, <laughs> um, something good going on. So I guess my question is, um, is there a limit to this? Are there uh, communities or newspapers where you feel that the nonprofit model or, or the approaches that you're taking, are, is there sort of a minimum viable um, product uh, limitation here? And if so, what is it? What are sort of the minimum requirements um, for a community or a paper to, to take this path? I have a thought about that, and I know that there are many of you in the room represent community foundations. I think that the path that, that you all have taken to place funds to support local journalism in a nonprofit like a community foundation is open to any, any newspaper, any media organization of any size. There's nothing that really would prohibit you from creating a contract with a local community foundation to do certain types of work. We're not saying that every organization should take the, the leap that we have. I think Paul's a really unique person who's willing to give up a tremendous asset and the power that comes with the voice of a, a newspaper to the community. I mean, Paul, honestly, it's a remarkable thing for someone to do. And I don't know how many other Paul Huntsmans there are out in the country who would be willing to, to turn over an institution like this to the community it serves. Um, but that doesn't mean that there's, you know, things along the way, along the continuum that don't, couldn't be used by other communities and other papers. We have a question here. Hello, my name is Ira Perman. I'm with the Atwood Foundation in Anchorage, Alaska, a foundation that is built on the uh, prior fortunes of the media. And I, first I'd like to applaud the four of you for being pioneers. You really are doing some remarkable work that is inspiring the field, certainly the Rasmussen Foundation and the Daily News inspire the work that we do. I have a question for, for Fraser and Paul. You guys are the first ones to make this change to a not-for-profit, what was a, still is a print media, and you're looking for funding to make that work. In 1967, Congress put into effect the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, which provides public funds for broadcast uh, entities, 1,400 of them, I understand. Would you be interested in hearing ideas of expanding that to print media? Well, I'll just say that this is a unique comment. I don't know if all of you will understand as it, as it relates to Salt Lake City, Utah. So Salt Lake is home to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints or the Mormon Church. There was a story that just came out uh, from the Washington Post about their balance sheet being over $100 billion. Uh, and so the question that I've received by many is, would you accept a contribution from, from the Mormon church? Uh, and I often dovetail that as well. Would you accept a contribution or would you allow the government to subsidize your work as well? And um, I've, I've really thought a lot about that and I'll be honest, I'm not sure really what the answer is on that, um, uh, you know, would, um, you know, considering and looking at how 
reckless some of our politicians have been as it relates to uh, different organizations that they don't like that are funded. Uh, would I want to be tied into that or, or, or have our newspaper associated with that? Uh, uh, I think that we can meet the funding obligations from among the community. There is so much money uh, out there in the country that philanthropic funds that are trying to find their way to good causes. And what I've seen that if you appeal to um, those individuals, those organizations, those foundations, there really is a willing appetite from members of the community that really want to support, regardless of their ideology or background, they all want to see a strong and vibrant local newspaper. And so, um, again, I, I would be very hesitant to accept federal funds, but I think that, uh, I think that the funds are there uh, among uh, local philanthropists. Thank you. We have a question back here. My question is for Paul. I'm Marcel Epley, the president and CEO of the Long Beach Community Foundation. I'm here with Mark Guillen, um, our board member, and um, David Summers from the Long Beach Post. And we've been exploring models in Long Beach. And one of the um, question marks kind of in my mind is uh, in terms of your board. So I heard you say that you're having your first board meeting soon. Yes. Um, have you thought about the challenge between sort of the control of the board versus um, you as the publisher and the staff and the editors? And um, you're, I don't know if you're relinquishing control or if it's a policy board. Like, what is the role of the board and how much are they, do they really have access to, into the day to day and the decisions of the newspaper? Sure, sure. So, we've got, uh, so one of the first documents that we drafted was the bylaws of the newspaper. Uh, there's a very strict wall between the board and the newspaper itself. The role of the board is like is not unlike any other nonprofit board. It's to provide the resources to the newspaper to ensure that they can do their job. And so, uh, you know, uh, the newspaper and myself, we've had a had a very good working relationship. I've really looked at my role over the last three years to, is to ensure that the newspaper has resources to uh, you know to do their job to provide independent um, journalism. Uh, to our community. And I really look at our board, you know, obviously we've got bylaws in place, and so I'm not too concerned. Uh, it'll be interesting to see how this plays out over the next year. Um, will there be, uh, I think the greater concern is when I go out and solicit seven-figure donations from members in the community, and when there's stories that are about them, uh, I expect to be getting calls from them, uh, and uh, and so uh, you know, will that be a challenge? Sure, but uh, but I think that's just you know, I, I just think that's that's uh, the world that we're going to have to work through, and uh, again, we're sort of transitioning into this era, but um, but uh, I'm not concerned with the board at all because we, again, we we've, we've got very strict bylaws in terms of uh, in terms of uh, the board's role and responsibilities to ensure that we have resources. Dan, you wanted to add something. Sure, before um, getting into philanthropy, because let's face it, nobody, when they're a little kid, somebody says, what do you want to do when you grow up, says, I want to be in philanthropy. We all fall into it from somewhere. Um, I ran the Alaska Public Radio Network, which is a 26 station network, uh, news network, basically morning news, noon and night. and. Uh, so I would say not all federal money is the same, not all government money is the same. Would we have taken direct support from the federal government for our news programming? No, we would not. Did we take money from the National Endowment for the Arts for arts programming? Yes, we did. Did we take money from the Department of Commerce for equipment? We did. And in addition to that, with public radio underwriting, we had money from oil companies, from banks, from telephone companies, all of whom were covered by the news. And I don't believe it ever affected anything that appeared in the news. Who took the phone calls from the angry companies? I did. My friend Sheila Toomey, who used mm -hmm. to use work for you, taught me, she's a, one of your longtime great reporters, said, mm -hmm. when they called, just say, I totally agree with you, reporters are scum. I couldn't <laughs> agree with you. I am so sympathetic by what just happened. 
you know, you deal with it, but I think, did they cancel their underwriting? I can't remember anyone ever did. Occasionally an advertiser will stop advertising. They almost always come back. Why? They want to be associated with us because we're popular with the public, the public values us, and they know if their name appears at the end of the news, it's positive for them. So you just yeah. manage it. So I wouldn't say at all that I have a big issue with government funding. Yeah, hi, Laura Esterman, San Francisco. I, I had a question for uh, Diane and David, and I just wanted to know if your coverage of alcohol and alcohol abuse has led to a change <clears throat> in the amount of money that has been awarded from the legislature or made a difference in the laws or the public health initiatives uh, that have, uh, and have, has there been a different kind of support uh, for programs for recovery or more education that is coming not from the news, but really actually in schools and um, public health organizations. Absol absolutely. So um, probably the biggest outcome we can show is that the age of people having their first drink is going up and the incidence of binge drinking is going down, the incidence of underage drinking is going down. Can you attribute it all to the coverage? Of course not, but we definitely think it's a factor. In terms of funding, um, there was significant funding that came from the legislature for Recover Alaska and its efforts. Um, everything about trauma-informed care, so a lot of people who have issues later on, behavioral health, experience trauma as children, and getting that, um, uh, more embedded into healthcare provision across the state. Uh, the, the new, uh, we have uh, legalized pot in the state. A significant amount of that money is going into after school programs for kids um, to try and provide healthy alternatives. And I really think Recover Alaska has been successful actually in changing the alcohol laws in the state of Alaska. So for example, there are very severe penalties for young people um, who, who drank and were caught. If you were 14 years old and you were caught drinking in Alaska, it stayed on the record the rest of your life. Wow. If you were 14 years old and killed somebody, it got taken off your record when you were 18. And it just happened because people were angry about some, uh, it was a young person driving, killed a cop um, on the road, and it was a, an overreaction. What happened is the penalties were so severe, this may seem counterintuitive, that law enforcement officials were reluctant to enforce the law because they didn't want to saddle a kid with a, an alcohol charge that was discoverable if they wanted to get into the military, go to college, get a scholarship, and so on. So it wasn't enforced. So we actually had a change to like a parking ticket, and you could get rid of the parking ticket if you attended um, uh, alcohol class. Uh, and so, um, Clearly, and the, you know, the background of that was the, the coverage in the Anchorage Daily News. We did a similar uh, project after that with the Fairbanks News Miner, which is now a nonprofit following in your footsteps um, as well. So I, I think there is a direct relationship between awareness um, among policymakers and, and from that coverage. But just to add, that, that's really not something we set out to do. We uh, really were we're kind of doing our own thing. Uh, and there really wasn't coordination like that. We were doing a deep exploration of the problem. Um, and I just, you know, would really want to emphasize that, that there, we were solely in control of the content. They, uh, the funders didn't know what the content was before it was published. Um, and if it had, had impact, that was great, but that really wasn't our objective. It was, it was to show the problem and the community could you know, could, could react as it, as it uh, chose. So here are four portraits of civic leadership. Um, and I want to give every one of you the last word before we end this session, but I also want to thank you all for your extraordinary leadership and energy and enthusiasm um, and leading the path forward. And so last words. Uh, and if any news organizations or funders are considering what we're talking about, I would just, my advice would be uh, that there has to be some level of trust going into it, but there then needs to be very clear 
uh, a very clear agreement, uh, what the rules are, where the lines are, that everybody understands entering into it. I'd agree, and I, I think uh, the last thing David said, each of our organizations went into this relationship with different objectives, um, but they were complementary, and I think the outcomes were good for both organizations. I'd say there are a lot of experts in this room. We've benefited from the help of the News Revenue Hub, from our friends at LenFest, from Facebook, and Report for America. There's so many tools available to us that no matter where you find yourself on the spectrum of a for-profit to a not-for-profit, take advantage of the wonderful investments that have been made by some of the major foundations in this nation to uplift all of us. So this last week, I just watched the docudrama of George Washington. And I was reminded of the fact that in an age of disruption and where um, uh, change is happening at lightning speed, that the work of journalism has not changed since the time of George Washington. And the way that we consume it, the way that we deliver it will continue to evolve and change but the hard work that journalists do has never changed from the foundation of our country and will not change. Thank you. Great.